Good morning, good morning, Rabotai. Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today uh, is dedicated in loving memory of Moshe Daba Halava Shalom, the Yudhishman Moshe Ben Gilsom, sponsored by Barbara and Haim Daba and family. Also, the Fuash Lema Fakhana Vatsamafega and Eliyahu Shimon Ben Mazal Fortune. Breakfast in the Class is dedicated for speeding complete Fuash Lema for Joyce Harari, Simcha Joyce Bat Selma Hava by her children Eli, Max, Ben, Lori, and family. And in loving memory also, of Joey, Joe, Joe Dur, Alava Shalom, Lilui Nishmat Yosef Ben Chenya, May his Neshama have an Aliyah, and thanks to the rabbis for their beautiful words of Torah each day by Claudia and Marcus Dur and family. Le- learning for this week is dedicated by Torah Center Silver Donor Miron Nisim, in memory of all those who perished on October 7th, all the fallen soldiers since then who gave their life to protect us in the state of Israel. <coughs> and finally, last but not least, to the belated birthday. A celebration of Jill Shanzer by a loving family. This is the third year that we are dedicating the class in honor of Jill's birthday, which represents a Chazakai. We look forward to God willing dedicating more Rabbi Fari's class in the years to come in honor of Jill and a growing passion for Torah and Yiddishkeit. That means Judaism. Okay. Uh, this is a, I have the extended version, the uncut, uh, uh, D- the DVD extras. Uh, Rabbi Fari was one of the very first Yurim to which Jill listened. And Rabbi Far has become a central figure in our family and is one of our rabbis. Amazingly, Jill's exposure to Rabbi Fari's Torah five years ago has now led to her learning Torah a number of hours each day. Rabbi Fari will always be the OG. Oh, that's so nice. Okay. I appreciate that. All right. My, my, my father is actually the OG, but I'll be the second OG, OG number two. Wishing Rabbi Fari's wonderful representative and incredible family good health and continued Yiddish and in the months and years ahead. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much. Please only answer Amen if you're listening to this live. So yesterday's class that I posted, my uh, recording of the class had the end chopped off. So I got a lot of uh, angry messages that the end of the class was not uploaded. So this is one of the benefits that you have of coming to a class live. That you can't ever get cut off. There's no buffering. You actually listen to the entire, you have to listen to the entire class. We'll see if we have a backup file uh, that we could uh, upload or fix it. I'm not sure that we do, uh, but that's one. And the second benefit is that you actually get to say amen <laughs> to the shahako uh, properly and exactly in the right time. Let's begin. <coughs> the Pasuk tells us in, uh, in Parashat Nasol, it tells us about uh, a situation where a person is witnessing uh, a, a sota. Let's take a look carefully at this Rashi, which is actually quoting the Gemara in Sota on Daf Bet. Daber of Bnei Yisrael, the Amata lehem ish ish, he to stay shto. There'll be a case of a woman who's a sota. What's a case of a sota? A woman who secludes herself with someone. And the husband is suspicious that they spend time alone, his wife and this man. So he says to his wife, that's called kinui. He tells her, listen, you know, I don't want you spending time alone with this person. Uh, um, you know, it's not, it's not appropriate, it's not right. And if she does it again, so that is aroused, obviously, a suspicion. After this kinui is there, so there's a suspicion that maybe something untoward is taking place. So the story of Sotah begins at that point. And now, if a woman admits that uh, something is happening, so then they get divorced and, uh, you know, and they each head off on their way. But if she insists that everything is on the up and up, she's completely tall, she wants to stay married, so then the husband gives her the process of the sota. The end of the sota, if it devolves into a difficult scenario, is very, very difficult. It's a hard thing to, to even imagine. Uh, how, how bad it is. But you should just know, Chazal tell us, that the punishment that happens to the wife uh, only happens to the wife if the husband is also a faithful, is a faithful person. If the guy is doing the wrong thing and he's uh, calling out his wife and doing the wrong thing, then there's no punishment. Uh, there's no punishment for her. So my friends, this idea, the concept of sota was designed to take a situation where she's actually pure She's actually done nothing wrong. There is 
some sort of circumstances beyond the control that were not, that were not suspicious, and a husband that actually wants to stay married, and it allows them to rebuild the trust that they had in one another. That's the concept of why the process of sota actually took place. But the ramifications when she's lying about it, even after being approached, even after being challenged, are such that the outcome is very difficult and gruesome. Fascinating, on this point, Rashi says, why do we have the parasha of sota next to the parasha of Nazir? We're going to read about the laws of a Nazir, where a person decides, that, uh, at least for 30 days, generally Nazirut is for 30 days, a person decides, I'm not cutting my hair for 30 days, I'm not going to drink wine for 30 days, I'm not going to become impure for 30 days. I'm going to live for this month in a state of complete purity. I always wondered if maybe that's the source for dry January. You know, you go a month without uh, drinking, uh, maybe that's where the Nazir come, the, 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 they got the idea from the Nazir. But either way, why are these two parashiyot together? Says the Gemara. If a person sees a sota in, uh, in this debased stage, in this messed up uh, uh, situation of uh, lack of faithfulness, of, of committing this great sin of gilu arayot, so what should he do? He should separate himself from wine. Who am I? I'm an innocent bystander. I happen to be at the temple on that day. I happen to see the situation of a sota being given. I happen to see the gruesome outcome. What's my relationship with this? Nothing. Why do I need to now take on a nizirut? Why is the Torah telling me, if you saw the sota in this situation, the person should uh, separate themselves from wine. Why would such a thing be? The Chachamin ask an even deeper question, okay? They really push the envelope. Um, the, the question is asked by the Sefer Pri Haaretz. I was blown away by this. He says, if anything, the exact opposite. You saw the terrible outcome that happened to a sota. What do you think? What do you think is going to happen to you? What are you going to think about doing or making that mistake? You're going to be someone that saw the cautionary tale, correct? So why me of all people, I should be the one that doesn't need this. Because I saw the terrible end of someone who engages in this practice. So why do I need this? I'm, of all people in the world, I should be the one that's protected from this. And he brings the words. The Priya Aretz, I saw in the Flo Techa Asikha, brings the words of Harambam. He says, The way of a human being is lihiyot nimshach bideotav. You are pulled, encouraged. Oh, Hazi, get him a tissue, get him a towel. You're burning? Yeah, okay? Hazi, Hazi, Hazi. Hazit, Hazit, Villa Barikh. You okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Kapara, kapara, kapara alecha. Okay. The Rambam writes that when a person witnesses things, their mind, their heart, their soul are drawn after what they are seeing. He says, a person hangs out with tzaddikim, what happens to them? They become a tzaddik. You hang out with a rabbi, you, hang, you, you learn more Torah, you're studying more, you're connecting more, the rabbi's talking about midot, slowly, slowly, he changes you. You hang out on the training floor back in the day, the odds of you not using four-letter words on the regular are very little. I have people who are the most respectful people in the world. I can't tell you. You talk to them, rabbi has everything... Baruch Hashem, Hazaku Baruch, Ishtabach Shemo. The minute they're talking about business, by the way, not with business partners, not with other people, even if they're talking about business with me. Rabbi, you don't know, I traded like this, I gave the guy like that, next thing I know, F-bombs, this bombs, that bombs, dropping. 
and they can't control themselves. Rabbi, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, should, I know I shouldn't speak that way. I'm so sorry. Next sentence. The next sentence. They can't stop themselves. Why? Because in the work zone, the brain has been programmed. You didn't go into it thinking that you need to use curse words in order to buy stocks. <laughs> but all the time, engaging in that practice, seeing that around you, or ultimately, it changes you. Says Rambam, therefore, a person should always be very careful who they're hanging out with, who their circle of influence is. Not only who they influence, but also who influences them. Okay? So therefore, says the Preet Sadiq, if you witnessed Sota Bikilkula, you witnessed a woman who's done the wrong thing, she wasn't faithful, she, you know, she's lying about it, she's, this, she's entered into this state of mind, you witness that, has an effect. Even if you saw the gruesome end, you need something now, you need an action to counterbalance the impact it's had upon you. I need everybody to hear that. If something is, if you've been exposed to something, and you think to yourself, oh, I'm so different. Rambam is telling you, understand. The Torah is telling you. Understand that that's going to have an impact on you. And make a considered response to something that's going to make sure that you've protected the person that you are. I'm going to give you a, a powerful example of this idea. I want you to imagine a person grows up in a house where the parents are smoking cigarettes. Is the child's uh, likelihood of smoking cigarettes higher or lower? Much higher. Here's the funny part. It actually does not depend who you ask. It's a literal statistic. Okay? You have a person who's hanging out with friends that smoke. Likelihood they're going to smoke more or less? Much higher. Okay? That's just statistics. Now here's the crazy part. You'd think that all those people who saw all those people smoking, who then saw all those people bar minan, get lung cancer, or lip cancer, or tongue, mouth cancer, whatever, you'd think that that would be something that would stop them. But actually, the statistics do not show that that actually takes place. You know why? Because the seeing of someone smoke packs a day, on and on and on and on and on and on and on, is a much greater impact than the one time death of the person. Fascinating. So an impact that happens again and again and again and again and again, eventually, by consistency, will have a greater impact than the terrible end that that impact that that thing actually had on people. Wild. Now listen to this, my friends. That's what Rambam is telling us. That's what this pasuk is telling us. There's a behavior you don't want. There's a language you don't want to use. There's a, 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 a what's it called? A mitzvah that you want to keep. Hang out for enough time with people who aren't keeping that, who aren't careful with that, who don't care about that. The reality is, it will erode your commitment and the thing you worked so hard to be able to bring will disappear. So the Torah says, the minute you've seen this, you know what you need to do? Yazir atzmo menayayin. You take a preventative measure. What do you do? You institute something, you promise yourself something, you take on something which is going to lock in that commitment. I'll give you an example of this concept. There's a guy I know was considering taking a certain job, a job that was going to be much better for him. He was going to earn, I don't know how many more times what he was earning. It's the dream. Everything's perfect. Anyway, he asked my advice. I told him, listen, before you say yes to the job, just tell him you want to sit in on a meeting or two, right? It doesn't have to be about an important project, so they're worried you're going to steal the, uh, steal the project. Tell him you want to sit in, you just want to see how they do business before you decide to join. Guy says, okay, great idea. 
He goes, he sits in on the meeting. Comes back afterwards. I, he said, um, uh, Rabbi, you know, everything's great. The place is on fire. I could see I'd make much, a lot more money there. He says, but I'm noticing one thing. I said, what are, you, what are you noticing? He says, I noticed that in the boardroom, I noticed that the way people speak to each other, I said, oh, did they, 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 they use foul language? He said, it's not the foul language. Foul language I've heard before, he said. He says, it's that everyone is always putting everyone else down. It's a very negative environment. It's an environment within which everyone is kind of trying to like fight to stay afloat, to be the dominant person in the room. So in order to do that, everyone's always attacking everybody else. And he said to me, he said, I'm very nervous about taking this position, if that's the culture in, this co in the company. I'm a person, I'm a, I, I try to be a nice, considerate person. I try to give people compliments. Imagine being in an environment where all day long, everyone's tearing each other down, finding the flaws in the other guys. I don't want that to be me. So I said to him, tell me, I don't know what position you know, you're going across for. Are you in the position where you're in the meeting? Or are you in a position where you're running the meeting? He said, I'm in the position that I'm running the meeting. Running. running the meeting. I said, will you have to interact with other meetings in the company? He said, no, very rarely. This division, this part of the company is really self Every Maybe once a year or twice a year we have to hang out with the other groups. I said, so you're in charge? He said, yeah. I said, and if you decide something, everybody has to listen. He said, yes. I said, okay. So if you made a rule, the... The, your industry equivalent of a swear jar. That if you know what a swear jar is. Swear jar is if you, if you curse. That people put a swear jar in their house. That if they curse or they say something not, uh, inappropriate language, you got to put $10. You got to find it has to hurt. $50. You can have different prices for different age ranges. $100 in the jar. You don't want the kid thinking, you know what? Boom! And you know what? It's $10, here's 20 for the next one. <laughs> right? You got to make it too expensive for the guy to take liberties, okay? I said, you have your version of the swear jar in the room. People know that if they speak negatively, negatively about someone, they lose, they lose that opportunity. They don't get to do that project. They're, I said, if you institute that, would that work? He said, absolutely it would work. I said, okay, then take the job and understand that you're going there, not as part of their culture, but to create a new culture. <clears throat> My friends, that's what the Pasukir is telling us. You could be part of a culture, or you could be the creator of the culture. This guy sees the sota, has an impact. You hear all the time about how everyone's doing this, everyone does that, and you don't. You think to yourself, you know something, look, I, I, it's true that I have this practice, but you know what? I'm the odd one out. I'm the Sadiq. You know, even if I, just one time, I'm still so much better than everybody else. Eventually hearing about something again and again and again erodes your sensitivity to it. So what does this guy do? He says, nah, -uh. 30 days, no wine, no messing around, no Tum'ah. I'm not touching the dead body. I'm going to maintain a state of purity. Right? This element of the nazir i'm growing my hair person starts growing his hair guy looks at him he says who do you think you are right aerosmith what's going on over here think some sort of rock star you have long hair now is this is it, who do you think who do you think you are the guy's making comments the nature of a nazir is to be impervious to other people the way they see you it's to decide for yourself i'm maintaining a level of kedusha it's deciding for yourself, I'm not going to let my guard down and wind up drinking wine and, and being a little bit loose around a negative influence. That's taking ownership over yourself and the culture you allow in your house, uh, in your family table, around the swimming pool, on vacation, whatever the case might be, or in your office. My friends, I want to share with you a beautiful example of this concept that uh, the, the Niflaotecha Asicha brings down from Maharil Diskin. 
he says something unreal. He says that we have a very famous mitzvah. Everybody knows this mitzvah. The mitzvah is dan if he dan et kol adam becomes zechut. Person has to judge other people favorably. Let's say I see a guy, uh, he's doing something wrong on Shabbat. He's doing something wrong. I don't know what the case is. He's not not being honest. I'm meant to judge the person favor. I'm meant to say, probably doesn't know. Or maybe he didn't grow up, he, doesn't, he didn't grow up with it. He's trying to grow, he's slowly, slowly, which is also, that's how growth happens, okay? You're meant to judge the person favorably, to diminish the, the evil, the wrong in what they're doing, in your mind. Says the Maril Diskin, one of the reasons why we have this practice is not only to judge the other guy favorably, but when you judge someone favorably, what are you doing? You're taking the sin that they did and you're making it smaller or non-existent. You're doing yourself a favor too. Because now I didn't witness this sin. I'm not hanging out with a guy that's doing the wrong thing. I'm judging him favorably. He's not doing that. He's not thinking that. He didn't mean that. When you live in a world where you see people in their best light, so you're not influenced by them at their worst. Because that's not how you see them. In many ways, judging favorably does a favor to you too, says the Maril Diskin. So this idea that we have in understanding the impact, whether we like it or not, of things that we see, that we witness, that we experience, is at the core of this teaching of the Torah. Let me end uh, with this uh, with this concept, this beautiful idea of uh, of Rav Baruch Ber. Um, they say, I mean, they say about Rav Baruch Ber. They say about the Chavetz Chaim. One was about America. One was about Russia. <coughs> But the stories are exact opposites of each other. They have the same root, but they don't have the same end. They say that Rav Baruch Be'er came to America, and for the first time in his life he saw a Jewish person not keeping Shabbat. He was very bothered, he'd never seen it before, starts crying. Anyway, a little while later, he sees it again, he's upset, but he's not crying. A little while later, he sees it a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, he, he just got used to it. At that point, when Rav Baruch Ber realized that he was witnessing something and it did not have any effect on him whatsoever, he sat down and he cried. They asked him, what are you crying for? You've seen it already a thousand times. He says, in the beginning I was crying for them. And now I'm crying for me. In the beginning I was crying that they're doing something wrong. Now I'm crying because that thing which is wrong makes no impact on me whatsoever. I got just used to it. I can just witness it, have it not bother me whatsoever. Smile, wave. Now I'm crying for me because my Shabbat has eroded. This thing is a reality. And it's important for us to understand that when we witness things with our eyes and listen to things with our ears, you know, when we experience things with our bodies, you go somewhere, you're seeing something, you're engaged in something. You think to yourself, I would never do this. Even, by the way, <coughs> when you see that that thing resulted in something terrible for the guy. Our rabbis are telling us that that's not enough. A person has to take a preventative action. They have to decide something as an example. There's a lot of Lashon Ara happening at your table. This happens to a lot of people. A lot of Lashon are happening at your table. You don't say to yourself, listen, you know what? That's them. That's my extended family. And I'm saying this, please forgive me for saying this. It's almost summertime. And in summertime, a lot of people in our community, and other communities also, they leave their homes. And now they're with their in-laws. Now they're with their sons-in-law, daughters-in-law, fathers-in-law, mothers-in-law. Now they're with their cousins. And suddenly your Shabbat table, a time you spend with your family, with your kids, is not only your immediate family. 
and you can't control what happens in that space. Correct? Suddenly your Shabbat might not be the Shabbat that you've grown used to, that you like. And you know when it's hardest? When you used to be just like that. You also used to love talking smack about everybody in the neighborhood. All of a sudden you come back, but you haven't done it in a year. You come back now, all of a sudden you step right back in. Everyone's hacking, and you're like, listen, maybe we shouldn't. They're like, you? You're the king of smack. <laughs> Your favorite cereal is honey smacks. <laughs> You're the guy who always had the gossip. You taught us all. That's the hardest. So what do you do? You now come back. You exposed to this for two months. All the work you did the whole year, you're going to throw out the garbage? The answer is, Yazir You proactively build a shield. That's what this Pasdik Amara is teaching us here. You saw Sota, it's going to affect you. What do you do? Build a shield. Do something proactive. Decide that, listen, guys, as a Zechut, you know, you want to tell people something. A lot of times you ask them to learn about Lashon Ara, about something. They're like, oh, you're very religious now. Okay. You know, relax. Maybe we're going to the wrong shul. I don't know what they're going to tell you. All right? You get very, you black, get black hat on me. Right? As if not speaking Lashon Ara is black hat. Okay? Guys, Isma, listen to this. You know what you have to say? You know what you have to do? Don't tell them. You're not learning, you want to learn the laws of Lashon Ara at the Shabbat table. Don't tell them you're doing that because, you know, it's not so nice way. Tell them, listen, guys, I heard it's a big sigula for Parnassah. Oh, so everybody's in. <laughs> really? Yeah, oh my gosh, I heard people make loads of money. Everybody's, really? Okay, brilliant. All of a sudden, you're, somebody's talking, they're like, shh, shh, we're doing the thing for the money, for the Parnassah. Do it for Rifu Ashim, for somebody. They'll feel guilty. Panasa works best though. <laughs> Someone's coming in with dessert. Stop with the dessert! You're ruining the panasa. Okay. Do something proactive. And when the person does that way, they actually can flip the script. And they can take something that potentially would have lowered their level of sensitivity. And actually, it, it can elevate. It could sanctify. It could mellow. It can make more sensitive the people of the family of your uh, immediate circle. And what a beautiful life you'd be creating for yourself when you're able to do that. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen. Amen. Rabbi Chananya.